I'm 20 years old, female, and this was the last time I willingly stayed in a room alone with a child. They used to babysit on the weekends when I was 15. Most of the families that I babysit for were nice, sophisticated families who had sweet children that I loved. However, the Cooper family were the exception. Mr. and Mrs. Cooper had two children, Michael, who was 10, and Antoinette, who was 4. Michael was quiet, though misbehaved and crazy demented. Antoinette was loud, cheerful, and the complete opposite of her brother. She was so innocent. I truly adored Antoinette, yet I despised Michael. He was an absolute terror. I'd watch over the two children on Friday nights for three hours while their parents went on a date, meaning three awful hours of psychological, emotional, and physical torture from Psycho Michael. There were many times that I would catch Michael staring at me while I was sitting at the dining room table doing my homework. I'd tell him to quit it, but he wouldn't stop until I moved out of view. Michael was really cruel to his sister. He would push her down the stairs, pull the heads off her Barbie dolls, and cut up her clothes. Michael would also hit the cats with a sock full of quarters. One cat actually ended up dying from internal injuries. He would growl at the neighbor's dog on a good day and tape stuffed animals to windows with scissors sticking out of their heads on a really bad day. He was a horrible little kid to say the least, but the scariest part about babysitting the twerp was the night that he came for me. Let's keep in mind that I wasn't supposed to even be there that night, but Mr. and Mrs. Cooper called my mom and asked if I could babysit for them since their other arrangement had fallen through. My mom agreed without even asking me. I was supposed to babysit from 5 o'clock in the evening until 10 o'clock at night. It was storming out, so the television had no signal and my cell phone didn't have any reception, and Antoinette was staying with her grandmother, leaving me alone with a psycho child for five whole hours. I'm glad to say that the first few hours went by pretty quickly and without incident. He was fed, bathed, then put to bed at around eight. Michael had fallen asleep the instant his head hit the pillow. I breathed a sigh of relief and lay down on the couch with headphones in, not knowing it would be a mistake. The music was loud enough to drown out any other sounds. I stared at the ceiling for a while because there was no use in trying to delve deep into the realm of social media. I drifted to sleep at some point only to be scared awake because of an intense pressure resting on my throat. Michael was standing over me with a wide smile, gripping the handle of the kitchen knife. I wasn't able to ask what he was doing due to the sudden fear that filled me. He pushed the blade harder and harder against my neck until I could feel a burning sensation. He laughed maniacally before running out of the room. I wiped the small amount of blood from my neck while searching the entire house, only to panic when he was nowhere to be found. The sound of the cat screeching caused a breath to hitch in my throat. I quickly grabbed the baseball bat from the linen closet and hurried up the stairs. My hand hesitantly grabbed the doorknob to Michael's bedroom. I pushed the door open, which I still regret to this day. My screams of terror were drowned out by his laughter. Michael was sitting in the open doorway of his closet, with the carcass of the cat lying in his lap. I really do wish I could say that the horror had ended there, but it didn't. No. That twisted boy chased after me, attempting to slice my back open with every step he took. The deranged psychopath managed to get close enough to plunge the knife into my shoulder. Needless to say, I ran out of the front door and didn't stop until I was hunched over trying to catch my breath, a block away from the police station. I packed up my things a few months after that, moved into an apartment with my now husband 1,000 miles away from the town that I grew up in. I had to move 1,000 miles away from Psycho Michael in order to feel safe, but even that made me crazier. I attended therapy for several years afterward. I couldn't sleep without the lights on because the image of him holding a dead cat had permanently seared itself into my mind. I was paranoid for months, afraid that he would jump out from behind a corner, and yet I still harbored the idea of having my own children one day. Truth be told, I honestly did care about the Cooper kids, but after the injuries I suffered, physical and psychological, my parents and I had no other choice but to press charges at the very least to pay for medical bills and counseling. Michael, being as young as he was, was committed to a psychiatric treatment and juvenile detention for nearly three to five years from what I heard. But 
After all the legal processes were complete, I couldn't bring myself to digging any deeper as to not relive that memory. Looking back on the incident now makes me feel silly for even being scared of a ten-year-old. It's strange how life works sometimes. It's strange how I just froze there. I eventually realized that I don't want children, and I absolutely refuse to babysit for anyone. Babysitting wasn't the job that I had imagined having while I was a senior in high school. I was paid a decent rate by the hour for watching kids that only needed to have an adult around while their parents were out. I know exactly what you're thinking. Why would you willingly waste your time watching children when you could have been working retail or some other halfway decent job? Am I close? Well, as you can imagine, the majority of kids I've looked after were happy, normal children, but my sister's children... Let me get to that. Here's a little background just to help you better understand why I don't foresee myself having children anytime soon, if ever. I'm a male and a social outcast at that. I was 16 when my mom told me that I'd be babysitting for my older sister. Naturally, I shrugged it off as it were no big deal because, I mean, what's the worst that could happen, right? My sister needed to go out of town on a business trip for two days, which then caused my mom to decide that I was the right candidate for the job. I learned very quickly that kids are hungry literally every five minutes, and they have no respect for the babysitter, and they are totally out of control without their parents around. That was a bummer. Kids are perceived as sweet, innocent, and all-around pure, yet I have first-hand experience on just how truly creepy some kids can be. I've been around my nieces and nephews dozens of times before, so there wasn't any reason for me to think that they were a bit peculiar, aside from the fact that I walked in on Nat, short for Natalie, attempting to sacrifice her sister to the devil in order to bargain for immortality by shoving Lux's hand into a blender. Luckily, I was able to pry her away from the blender before she could turn it on. I had been watching them for less than 20 minutes when that incident occurred. Fast forward to this first afternoon, the kids were playing in the toy room, so I decided to watch television before doing my homework. I was in the middle of a funny movie when I cut the side of my neck with scissors. He drew a pentagram on the floor with ketchup, chanted something in a language that I didn't recognize. They probably made it up and locked Jay in the basement. Tony was the good kid who explained that Mike was trying to summon a demon. Someone that is close to the devil so that he could bargain Jay's soul for immortality. Mike angrily hissed at me when the plan didn't work. I swear to God, those freaking creepypastas they watch really don't help them. It was then that I learned that they had a crazy obsession with vampires. The need to be immortal and trying to draw blood from people is their way to fulfill the desire to be like the people in movies or books. These kids were actually trying to figure out ways that they could become immortal without having to stay so small for all of eternity. I thought that was a bit unhealthy. I still have no idea how the internet or horror movies when their parents weren't looking really activated this, but I'm honestly still scared of what could have happened. Nat was the eldest child. She was the bad influence on her siblings. She was the entire reason why everything went down on the second night. I was studying for a calculus test that I had the next day. The kids were supposed to be playing in the backyard, which was the mistake. All I really remember about studying is that I had been exhausted from chasing around those brats the night before because I ended up falling asleep at the kitchen table. I woke up sometime in the afternoon with my hands and feet tied to a metal pipe in the basement while my deranged nieces and nephews stood over me with a weird look in their eyes. I struggled for a good ten minutes to free myself from that stupid rope as they chanted some weird language again. I assumed that they were really trying to sacrifice me, however, I was relieved when I saw one of the cats knock a candle off the windowsill. The carpet and lengthy silk curtains immediately caught fire, which caused the kids to untie me. We rushed out of the house and to safety just in time to watch the house burn, literally to the ground. I stood motionless for what seemed like hours before eventually the police were called by the neighbors. I called my mom to come get the kids before being questioned by police for over three hours. The detective that was interrogating me surely was about to arrest me, but the fire department later ruled that the fire was an accident. 
My sister angrily barged into my room once she arrived home and informed me that I was no longer allowed to babysit her kids again and literally almost beat me senseless if it wasn't for my parents stopping her fury. I cried tears of joy at the news and never babysat again. I tried to explain the story to both the detectives and my family, though my nieces and nephews' stories all apparently corroborated against my own, and there was nothing I could do. Needless to say, I never visited their family again, both by being shunned and by choice. Natalie and the other kids all grew out of the vampire phase from what I heard once they hit junior high and acquired less creepy, less dangerous interests. I'm 28 years old now, incredibly far away from my family, married to the most amazing woman, yet I still refuse to think about having children. You never know what they're going to get into. Back when I was 17, I used to babysit for our neighbor, who at the time was a single mother who happened to be going through a particularly nasty divorce. She had two young sons, one of which was eight years old while the other was only around 18 months. They were absolutely adorable and very well-behaved kids, but you could tell that they were going through a lot. And the older one definitely showed signs of stress over the whole thing. And I'll never forget the time he asked me why his daddy couldn't live with them anymore and it honestly broke my heart. Not because I didn't have an answer for him, but because to hear it would have just been too much to bear. Too much for anyone to bear. Anyway, after a few months of being alone, she finally decided to get back on the old dating horse. I was so happy for her. After such a rough time, she deserved to find happiness again, to find someone who had the wherewithal to be a real father to these two adorable little boys. So one night, she leaves on her date and says she'll be back around midnight and not a moment later. Only she doesn't tell me exactly where she's going and I have no way to contact her because this was back in the 80s and no one had a cell phone. Well, they did exist, but not in the available commercial sense. It was all landlines back then. Otherwise, this might not have gone the way it did. So on the night in question, I'm chilling on the couch, absent-mindedly flicking through the TV channels. I put the kids to bed an hour previous. They're sleeping like rocks and everything seems fine and dandy when suddenly there's a knock at the front door. I wasn't expecting anyone, but then again, it wasn't my house, so I felt kind of obligated to answer and take a message or whatever. Only as I started walking down the hallway towards the front door, whoever is on the other side starts banging against it and cursing up a storm. Cheryl, I know you're in there. Open the door. Now what was exactly said... I don't remember, but I'm not keen on repeating some of the words they used. It was really, really harsh. So I'm just frozen, looking at the door in total fright when the oldest boy came flying out of his room and down the stairs, running to the door and yelling, Daddy's home! I grab him, pull him away from the door. I had no idea what this guy's intentions were, and after all, they were probably divorced for a freaking reason. But I almost fainted with fear when I hear the words, I got my shotgun in my truck, and tonight, I'm going to teach you a lesson you'll never forget. He screams this, but then I hear his footsteps move up the gravel path. It appeared he wasn't bluffing at all. And if that was the case, then our lives were clearly in danger. When he gets back, he's banging on the door and threatening to start shooting through it if no one opens. I grab both kids and run out the back door and across the street to my house where my mom calls the police. When the police arrive a few minutes later, they actually find the ex-husband taking a massive dump on Cheryl's porch. He was arrested, and I wait with the kids at my house for their mom to show up. Everyone was in tears by that point, even my mom, who was normally a pretty reserved woman. I mean, maybe he was just having a manic episode and no one was in real danger, but honestly... It was one of the most terrifying nights of my entire life. First and the last time I babysat, back when I was 16 in the early 80s. I'd just gotten a driver's license and needed gas and insurance money for the old beat-up car I'd bought. 
I was watching two boys, about six and ten, while parents went out to celebrate some anniversary or something. They had promised to be home at eleven. At the time, cell phones were pretty rare, so no way to contact them other than calling the restaurant. Evening was going great until about 9.30 when their large, aggressive Doberman goes crazy running around the house barking and growling before running into the basement, refusing to come up. Sort of freaks me out a bit because this dog is huge, aggressive, and very protective of the house and kids. I do a quick check of the house and kids and everyone was okay. I let the dog stay in the basement, put kids to bed at around 10 as instructed by the parents, job done. So I'm watching TV at around 10.30 when, suddenly, I begin to smell something burning. Running into the youngest boy's room and find the oldest boy in bed with him. Both are asleep, so I wake them both and tell them that we need to get the dog and go outside. But the dog just straight up refuses to leave the basement. And I had to prioritize. So I get the kids outside and tell them to sit in the front yard while I go in to call the fire department. Not showing good judgment here, but I was 16. Oldest says, I left a candle burning under my bed. As I go back in, yup, a candle under their bed, since apparently monsters couldn't live anywhere where there's light. I know, dumb kids. As I open the door to go back in, there's this huge explosion behind me across the street and power goes out. The kids start screaming and follow me back into the house. I grab the phone, but there's no dial tone. I get the kids out of the house again, onto the back porch this time, and make it really clear that they're stay there. But I can still hear the dog whimpering in the basement. I run to the oldest kid's bedroom with the fire extinguisher and flashlight from the kitchen and look under the bed through hazy smoke. The offending candle has gone out, but has burnt a hole in the box spring, which also has gone out. I flip the box spring and blast it with the extinguisher just in case. I then run to the front porch to see the transformer on a telephone pole had exploded. A lightning pole... What? Lighting the pole on fire and taking out the phone and electricity service for the street. I run and check on the box springs which are still out. I open the bedroom windows to air out the room then get the kids off the back porch into the living room onto the couch where they both are just crying their eyes out. The oldest was apologizing for the fire but insisted that if he didn't keep the candle lit, then, of course, monsters would get him. Fire department shows up for the Transformer at around 11. Kids fall asleep on the couch at around midnight after watching the firemen across the street put out the Transformer fire, and the power comes back on at about 1.30 a.m. The parents show up at 2.30 a.m. when they were supposed to be back by 11. They're somewhat buzzed and start complaining that the kids are not in bed and the oldest room is trashed with a flipped over mattress and dry fire extinguisher powder covering the box springs. And to add insult to injury, they straight up refuse to pay me. The situation gets really tense and, would you believe it, the Doberman picks this time to come out of the basement and starts aggressively growling at me. Walked out with a dollar to my name and I never babysat again. So, for the longest time in my teenage years, I earned a few bucks a week by doing babysitting work. It always made me giggle at how there are so many urban legends based around babysitting. The serial killer that stalks the unwitting teen, the call coming from inside the house, pretty much every Halloween movie in some manner that seems to present babysitting as the vocation of those with a death wish. When in reality, the only thing likely to kill you is the boredom. Sure, you get a bratty kid and it makes an evening a little more challenging, but you get a good one and you're basically sat on the couch for hours on end watching tedious cable TV shows and counting the minutes until the parents get home. Saying that, I did babysit for one family that ended in a frankly terrifying experience that ended up in me never, ever sitting for them ever again. It only happened once, but sometimes once is enough. So I arrive at this big old house a few blocks away from my parents' house at around 6.30 one Friday evening. The parents of the kid seem incredibly charming, and the kid is one of the more adorable little tykes that I've had the good fortune of minding. We go over a brief list of rules, 
what the kid is and isn't allowed to eat, how much I'll be paid and how long I'll be sitting for and that sort of thing. Then the parents head out to whatever fancy party that they had been planning on tending. All goes well for a little while. The kid wouldn't eat their carrots, but when I pretended that they were delicious by taking little bites myself, they soon broke into a smile and pretty much demolished the little bowl of hummus that we were sharing. With the kid fed, I gave her a bath, tucked her into bed, and that's that. It was honestly one of the easier jobs I'd had, right up until the sun started to go down. So once the kid's asleep, I head downstairs to order a pizza on the parents' dollar. Like I said, they were perfectly nice and polite when we first met, and it's not often that job comes with free food. Pizza arrives pretty quickly, and I even tip the delivery guy a few dollars just to say thank you for being so fast. He's literally counting out the change in dollar bills when his head snaps to the side, like he's looking into the bushes at the side of the house. I ask him if everything's okay, peering out from the door to see what he's looking at. But there's nothing, just dark bushes. He says something along the lines of, Ah, sorry, because I'm just tired. Mine's play tricks on me. He laughs awkwardly, then walks back to his car while thanking me again for the tip. I didn't think anything of it. I mean, it was probably just a cat or something, right? So we got back inside to eat, have a full-on carb overload, and end up just lying there on the couch watching TLC. There were these big bay windows in the family's TV room, and I had drawn the curtains earlier to block out the glare on the TV. Only I hadn't drawn them all the way, and there was a slight crack in the curtains that allowed me to see into the dark front yard. At one point, my eyes were drawn to this little crack, and I could swear I saw a dark shape where street lights were previously visible. I sit up, focusing my eyes on the shape and wondering if it were my mind playing tricks on me this time. When it moved, I wasn't going nuts. I had been looking at someone or something who was in turn looking at me through the big old windows. That's about when I started to freak out. I had been super chilled all evening, but now I was getting that distinctly paranoid feeling like someone was watching me, someone who didn't exactly have the best of intentions. I run around the house, making sure all the doors and windows are locked as a precaution, all before keeping their cordless phone as close as possible so that, if it came to it, I could call the cops. I was sure I had seen someone, but the chances of them just vacating the area at the sight of flashing lights then returning later could be a huge possibility and a terrifying one at that. So I decided to shoot my shot only when it would be absolutely necessary appearing to waste police time would not be doing me any favors. I suppose I'm just trying to explain why I didn't call the cops right away. I've had friends of mine say that they have just called 911 right then and there, but I wasn't 100% sure of anything right then. I'd seen a shape, Michael Myers pointing a knife at me. Life isn't black and white most of the time, I was thinking. Anyway, I've secured all the windows and doors, shoved the cordless phone into my hoodie's front pouch and had even positioned a little league bat near the couch so that I was sort of armed. So by that point, I started to feel relatively safe again. If there was some creeper lurking outside looking to prey on a teenage babysitter, they would get one heck of a rude awakening when I waved my bat at them and screamed that the cops were on the way. So I lie back on the couch but naturally find myself unable to relax. I open the curtains back up so I can see if anyone is hanging around in the front yard, keeping my eyes on the windows every so often in between watching whatever social train wreck is on TLC. Nothing happens for a while, and I start to think it was all just in my head or something. Right about the time I get up to wander into the kitchen to grab a drink of water. As I'm in there, I get that intense feeling that I'm being watched. I turn to see that same dark shape in the kitchen window, only this time, I rush into action. I hammer 911 into the phone, telling the dispatcher I need the cops to my address ASAP, that there's a home invasion in progress. I honestly don't know if it was the adrenaline or I was just sick of pervs thinking they can get away with stuff like that, but I just sort of charged. After screaming out that the cops were on their way, I ran into the TV room, grabbing the Little League bat and just 
ran for the back door which led out of the kitchen and into the backyard. What happened next is frankly astounding. As I ran at the guy, baseball bat in hand, ready to bash his brains out right there in the yard, I recognized him instantly. It was a face I'd seen before, not long ago at all. It was the kid's dad. So long story short, the dad of the kid I'd been babysitting had, for whatever reason, decided he needed to see what kind of babysitter I was. So apparently he drove his wife to whatever party they were headed to, turned back saying he'd forgotten something, then decided to watch me over the course of about an hour or two to see if I was worth the cash that they were spending. Obviously, since no crime was actually committed, there was no one to charge. The dad offered me a sincere apology, even offered me double the cash just to finish the night up, but I refused. No amount of money could have persuaded me to stay, and needless to say, I was very selective with who I babysat after that. I'm 24, female, and this happened at my old job. My mom decided that I needed a job, one that wouldn't cause much stress, interfere with school, and could keep me out of trouble on the weekends, so I elected to babysit for neighbors, cousins, and other families around my neighborhood. I was 17, I had a good time with friends, and it was the easiest way to make money. Seeing the kids' face light up when they would see me made the job that much more enjoyable but the last group of kids I babysat were weird. I would watch them four days a week. I would help them with their homework and make sure that they were fed and asleep by seven o'clock at night. Things were great for the first few months, but I began to feel like they were imagining things or something, which is when things got weirder. Marissa was the oldest, she was eight. Larry was the middle child, he was six, and Alexis was the baby, she was three. I can recall one particular night when I was swamped with homework. The kids were watching TV in the living room while I was sitting at the kitchen table. Math wasn't the easiest subject for me, so it took more time to concentrate on being too focused on something else while babysitting isn't a good thing. A while had passed until I realized that the house was strangely quiet. I looked up from the table to see the kids sitting on the kitchen floor, looking up at me with those sweet eyes. What are you doing? I asked. Waiting to go home? Marissa smiled. You're already home, silly. No, we live with you, she said. I'm only the babysitter, sweetie. I watch over you when mom and dad need a night for themselves. I laughed. But Jackson said that you were our mom. You gave us these new parents because you had to. Who is Jackson? I questioned. The man in my closet. She responded. How long has that man been in your closet? I don't know. She shrugged. But he says that you're pretty and kind. <laughs> you have quite the imagination, Nerissa. I chuckled. A sinking feeling of dread settled over me when I heard the floorboards overhead creaking because of something walking around. The heavy footsteps frightened Larry and Alexis. They tightly hugged my legs while Marissa looked at the ceiling. Jackson's here, she clapped. I never jumped out of my chair faster than I had at that moment. I scooped the kids up in my arms and rushed them to the front porch. I need you to go to Mr. Hughes's house and get help. But we want to stay here with you, she pouted. Just go, I pushed her. They didn't really understand why I was being so frantic, but... Marissa nodded before grabbing her brother and sister's hand. I watched them run off the porch and across the yard before I stepped inside the house to face whatever it was inside the child's bedroom. I grabbed a knife from the kitchen sink, slowly crept up the stairs and stood outside of Marissa's room. I gently pressed my ear against the door. Muffled noises met my line of hearing, which caused me to swing the door open. Marissa's window was open. The cool breeze drifting into the room caused alarm bells to go off. I know for a fact the window was closed prior to putting those kids in front of the TV. The dresser drawers were open, clothes strewn across the floor and toys scattered on the bed. It was at that moment, as I was reaching for the protruding light switch, that I asked myself why I didn't just call the police. I suppose it was just instinct to defend the children. 
I flick the light on to see the man sitting in the closet, his back against the wall, his belt undone and a toothless grin greeting me. You're even prettier in person, he wheezed. My chest felt like it was tightening. I struggled to take a breath, but the sound of sirens filled me with relief. The man jumped up from the floor, knocked me into the wall and ran out the room. I sank to the floor and let the tears go. The kids made it to the neighbor's house and banged on the door until Mr. Hughes answered it. He was alarmed when he saw the bedroom light illuminate the backyard, so he called 911. Mrs. Hughes sat in the dining room with Marissa, Larry, and Alexis until the police arrived. The man hiding in the closet had apparently been living in there for a few weeks. He was in his 40s, strung out on something and homeless. I don't know what happened to him, but that ended my babysitting career permanently. My advice to anyone who might babysit in the future, please check the house before you get too comfortable. You never know what is going to happen. As any parent can tell you, leaving your children home with a babysitter is one of the hardest things you can do. Fortunately for my husband and I, we really have an amazing babysitter. She watches our kids whenever we need her. It can be for 20 minutes because we are late getting home from work or for an entire weekend. It's all worth noting that my husband and I travel sometimes for our job. Our babysitter only lives next door and I've known her since she was born. She's a very sweet 18-year-old girl who will be starting at a university and pre-med in the fall. She finished toward the top of her class and plans on becoming an orthopedic surgeon. Needless to say, I trust her with my two children who were six and four years old, respectively. Like many Saturday nights, my husband and I had a work function to go to, and like many times before, we called our trusty babysitter, and she of course accepted and was happy to help. We left at about 7.30, and as we pulled out of the driveway, I noticed that the garage door was slightly ajar. Now, my husband is the super anal type and never leaves doors half open like that. He also has all of his tools and whatnot in that garage, so I knew he wouldn't just leave it open like that. But I thought, eh, whatever, the wind probably pushed it open. As the night went on, I began to feel more and more uneasy, and I couldn't quite explain it. I decided I needed to check on my children. It was summertime and the sun was just starting to set at about 8.45ish. I got hold of the babysitter after only one or two rings. She said they just finished some hot dogs and were going to be settling down and watching a movie for the night. I admit this gave me some comfort, but I still couldn't quite shake this feeling that something wasn't right. I called back a minute later and asked if she could check on the side window and tell me if the garage door was shut. She told me it was. I double-checked and asked if it was shut or just mostly shut, and she said, no, it's definitely shut. As we hung up the phone, I didn't feel right at all. In fact, I felt sick to my stomach. I begged my husband to go home. He complied with little convincing. I could tell he was slightly annoyed, but he would do anything for me. I called back a third time in the car, and for the first time in years of watching my kids, she didn't answer. I called right back and she didn't answer again. As we approached the house, my heart fell into my stomach. I noticed that the side garage door was now wide open. As my husband turned into the driveway, my uneasiness turned into absolute terror. There was a man trying to climb into the kitchen window. He turned and looked at us in the driveway like a deer in headlights. He was a rough-looking man, maybe in his mid-twenties. He was covered in a scruffy beard and a hood. His teeth were yellow and his eyes bloodshot and had not one, but two knives hanging out of his back pocket. I was frozen in fear. My husband wasted no time and got out of the car and chased him down. He caught the man and held him down. My husband is a big man and this man was somewhat skinny. I called the police and they arrived in minutes. I went inside to find my babysitter in the basement with my children. She had candles lit and weird relic-like symbols all around. When she saw me, she just started to chant and laugh. The cops were called and thankfully arrived quickly, eventually arresting her and the man. Thankfully, my children were safe and unharmed. What the cops told me after the situation still gives me a sickening feeling. Apparently, my younger babysitter met this man at the end of the school year. Apparently, they had joined a Scientology group together. 
they started using together and experimenting with various rituals. The documents later recovered with the ritualistic items included text stating two sacrifices were required. They were going to sacrifice my own children. They also told me that this man was probably living in my garage for about a week or so given the food and urine they found stored in the crawl space in the garage. I've since done everything possible to pursue charges to the furthest extent of the law. We have also moved to my mother's house until we can find another area and house to live in. It just goes to show you that you can never quite trust the babysitter. This happened to me approximately 18 months ago during my first year of college. Just to give a little bit of reference, I'm a 20-year-old female, barely over 5 foot tall, very thin, and guys objectively find me attractive. I tell you this because working in customer service, I am used to a mild flirting and attention from male customers. It has never really bothered me much before because up until this point, I hadn't experienced anything creepy or abnormal. Coming from a large, low-income family, I've always been a hard worker and someone who is constantly looking for ways to make more money. During my first semester, I found a job at a local coffee shop, which worked out perfectly. It was right up my alley, they were super flexible with my hours, and it was located near the college, so I got to meet a lot of new people that I went to school with. After about a month or so, I started to notice the regular customers and even could remember some of their orders. Among some of the regulars was a really handsome businessman who always wore a suit and tie every time I saw him. I thought maybe he was a professor, but I couldn't remember ever seeing him on campus. He was tall, maybe six foot one or so. He was very muscular, tan, and had slick black hair. I always waited on him, and he always flashed a smile and was very polite, saying thank you, honey, or sweetie, and would leave the store, sometimes leaving a sizable tip in the tip jar. He started to come in more regularly and actually came in every day for about two weeks, and then he finally spoke to me. And I mean actually spoke to me outside of just ordering coffee. He made some harmless joke and maybe a flirtatious comment, I don't really remember exactly, but he asked if I would perhaps be interested in babysitting his daughter this weekend. I really didn't know what to say as it was kind of out of the blue and he didn't even know me. He sensed my hesitation and said he didn't mean to make me feel uncomfortable, but his regular sitter canceled at the last minute and he had luck finding students at local businesses in the past. I guess because it was a smaller college town. Being a little naive and very eager to make some extra money, I accepted the offer and told him I would be willing to do so. I was always the type of person who always sees the best in people and never really focused on the negative, which in retrospect was not very smart. My logic was that this person was a very handsome man who looked well put together and appeared to have everything together, which is more than I can say about 95% of the people I meet there, so nothing to worry about, right? So because I wanted some details and additional information, I asked for his address and if he could show me a picture of his daughter. I was unfamiliar with his address and he said he didn't have any photos of his daughter on his phone, which seemed a little weird, but I didn't think much of it. He took out his wallet and showed me a very old looking photo of a young girl and then proceeded to show me two more photos of her from his wallet. He isn't in any of the photos, but at the time, I really didn't seem to notice that. So him and I exchanged numbers and agreed on a time, pay, and all the other details. Later in the day, we started exchanging more details via text. He wanted me to come over at 8 p.m., which seemed to be a little late. But then I thought, whatever, the kid will probably be asleep and I can just watch Netflix or something until they get home. Easy, much-needed money for me, I thought. Saturday came and I texted him to confirm the time. He responded and okayed everything, but was being very flirtatious, sending a bunch of emojis and things like that. I brushed it off and ignored it for the most part. I told my boyfriend the address of where I was going to and let him know that I would call him if I needed anything. My boyfriend is the rational one in the relationship and he was not very keen on this idea in the first place. He tried to talk me out of it, but I really needed the extra cash. Now this is where things start to take a turn. I pull up to the address and notice there really isn't very many houses around the area. In fact, the houses that were around looked like they were not very well taken care of. The man's house was very low-lit and very run-down, with tall grass and weeds in the front yard. 
I remember thinking of the nice clothes slash watch that he wears, and the house just did not match the guy. While well, not trying to judge a book by its cover, I reluctantly went up and knocked on the door. The man answered the door in sweatpants, definitely not seeming to be ready to go out. The house was very dark and uninviting. As I walked inside, I could feel the darkness swallow me. I looked around and all I could see and smell was filth and trash. This house was unlivable, especially for a child. I turned around, freaking out, and immediately before he could even say anything and asked, Where's your daughter? The man said that his wife and daughter will be home any minute. Now, I'm a very observant person, and I waited on this man every day and never once saw a ring on his finger. At this point is where full alarm bells are going off. Trying to remain calm and slowly move toward the door, the man insists that I go see the amazing playroom they built in the basement. I will never forget the look in his eyes at this point. His eyes were deranged and he had a sinister smile. The handsome man I waited on every day slowly evaporated away, and I was now standing face to face with an apparent psychopath, one who wanted me to see his special basement. I didn't even think, and what happened next I still can't even believe I did. I sprayed the man right in the face with pepper spray and ran out the door and got into my car. Being a small female college student, naturally, I always had pepper spray in my purse. Once in my car, I began to process everything that just happened. I started to shake and tremble and felt like I couldn't move. What happened next still sends chills down my spine. As I looked up through my rearview window, I saw the man full-on sprint out of his front door and get into his car. I peeled off so fast and drove straight to my boyfriend's house. Being the stupid teenager that I was, I never once called 911. I did text the man that night and told him I called the cops and would call them again if I ever saw or heard from him again. He responded with LOL in all caps. Barely being able to sleep at all that night, I finally managed to fall asleep at around 3 or 4 a.m. after being consoled by my boyfriend. I woke up at about 9 a.m. to a message that still haunts me to this day. Looks like I'll have to find another babysitter with two winking emojis. I finally called the cops because I was petrified this guy would try and find me again. The police were able to track the number and actually found the phone. It was found in a dumpster near my boyfriend's house, but they were unable to pursue any further as he didn't really commit any crimes or commit any acts of stalking. My boyfriend did some research on the address of the home and it was repossessed by the bank three years prior. All I can think about is the playroom and what could have been down there waiting for me. I let my manager at work know about this so he could try and get his face on the security camera the next time he came in, but thankfully, he never again came to that coffee shop. I've since moved home and transferred schools. This night changed my life. I went from a naive, innocent little girl to someone who became aware of the true monsters that exist in this world. Who knows if he is still out there trying to take advantage of a young woman like me. Around the age of 18, my dad's boss had a kid with his wife. These people had it in their heads that the responsibilities of children wasn't enough to hinder their rights to party. And because my dad was completely subordinate to this guy... He offered me up as a babysitter to help solidify the possibility of getting a raise at the start of the new fiscal quarter next year. He told me it was good for all of us, seeing as mom was a stay-at-home and dad was the only breadwinner in the tribe. I remember him telling me it was my turn to step up to the plate. Sure, it sucked because these gigs went down on Fridays and Saturdays from 6pm, going on to what was occasionally 6 in the morning, but at the same time, the gig was an easy one. Do the trick was to just put the poor kid to bed and then just wait it out. These were opportune moments to get some homework done or study for exams or whatever other justification there was that seemed necessary to remind myself that I was sitting in this stranger's house while they were doing what someone at my age should have been doing. The unfairness only stung for a short period of time, but hey, my dad needed the raise, I thought. The gig played out the same way every weekend. My dad's boss and his wife dressed up and went to the clubs or whatever, and I was left on my own devices. The place was pretty nice, all things considered. They even had a 60-something-inch TV that had HBO, which was cool for catching up with Game of Thrones or what have you. 
But truthfully, I just sat on the couch and flipped through textbooks and fought the urge to pass out. Once the baby's down for the night, that's basically that. At first, I thought it would just be for a few weeks, but eventually it became months. Every weekend without fail, I was sent to the O'Brien estate to take care of their infant daughter. There were a few times where I refused, that I had plans that I intended to make good on, and my dad was fine with it, at least up until he made the call to his boss. One terrible time later, I was right back on the couch staring at a clock, feeling my youth get siphoned out of me by total strangers. Praise the Lord for responsible adults, right? It's just completely mind-blowing how his boss somehow became my boss too, and all the while he shared nothing with me, saying he'd compensate my dad who in turn would pay me, but of course he never did. Hey dad, you get that raise yet? I'd ask each day. By the first week it was a real question with a strong hope for a positive answer, but eventually it devolved into sarcasm until finally plummeting into malice. When the answer is always the same, you just know that you're blowing hot air. He doesn't know how good he has it, I would retort every time to his justifications. I'm no genius by any stretch, but at least there is enough on the plate here to deduce that this was pure manipulation on his boss's behalf. And my dad being the essential breadwinner, there was no room for negotiation. He was caught, hook, line, and sinker, and now he can't seem to get out of it. I recall telling him to contact HR, but every time I'm met with a simple, it's complicated remark. His expression as sullen as a morning fog. Obviously, there was something else at stake here. Some form of leverage that leaves my dad reeling across that thin line. For lack of a better word, the reason was political. He worked extremely long hours ranging from 14 to 20 hours a day. Occasionally, he became a ghost for a week. Rare sightings at 2 in the morning as I go to the bathroom for whatever reason that night. By the 8th week, he looked less like my dad and more like a hunk of beef jerky. The job was taking its toll and yet no raise. And there I am, every weekend sitting on the culprit's couch, doing a better job at taking care of their baby than they ever could, silently growing angry at the sight of their interior. The furnishing matched the expectation of a BP salary and... Yet all he did for his living was a fraction of what he made my dad do. All this lavish living and yet my dad, in spite of all these things, was just barely scraping by. It was around 11.30 on the dot that the knock came. I remember looking at that clock and wondered if this was some kind of delivery. It's one thing to find yourself in a circumstance you have little to no bearing in. That immediate sense of responsibility, knowing that... All you do is fumble it for lack of knowing just about anything. All this in mind, I answered the door by opening it just a crack. It was a businessman of sorts. White shirt with khakis held up suspenders, all adorned by a blue and red striped tie. His hair was gray, his wrinkles deep, and yet I could tell he was only in his thirties. He reminded me so much of my dad I almost thought it was him, but it was in the eyes that gave it away. They were wide and round, crazed and bright, whereas my dad's were sunken and dark. Can I help you? I asked with little to no confidence. That it was just something about that look in his eyes. Was it desperation or fear? Mr. O'Brien? Uh, he is uh, not here right now. Probably won't be back until late. The man winced back as if the words hurt him. Those eyes of his, already huge, somehow got bigger. And who are you? He asked. I'm just the babysitter. The man reached into his pocket and let his hand rest. I could see the impression. It was as clear as day, as clear as fresh water. He put his hand on a gun. I felt my heart rise into my throat. Can you call him? I need to speak with him. Yeah, sure. Just stay right there. I quickly moved to shut the door when the man swiftly lunged his thin hand against the frame to stop it. I let out a gasp and felt my body turn into jelly in an instant and every part of me becoming utterly unstable. I wanted to tell him mean things, to demand him to leave, that he was horrifying, but I wish I never found myself being inducted into this terrible situation, that this was a feud between my dad and my boss and I was nothing more than a prop that I had nothing to do with whatever was going on between him and me, O'Brien, and yet the only thing I could articulate was, Uh-huh. 
It's true. You can be a hero in your mind, but the reality of it is, is that when things get real, most people just shut down. It must have seen it all. He let out an assuring grin and led his hand off the frame. I'm sorry, miss. I didn't mean to scare you. It's fine. I'll, I'll wait out here. He took a step back, his other hand never leaving his pocket and never leaving the gun. But please be quick about it. I'm in a hurry, you know. I closed the door and put my fingers in my mouth. It took everything in me not to scream. I was frantic at this point, recalling that my dad's boss left a number for his cell somewhere, but for the life of me I couldn't remember where. Was it reasonable to call it? Wouldn't it be safer to just call 911? I pulled out my cell phone and called my dad instead. Frantic and in tears, my whirlwind of emotions were streaming into the phone before he could even finish saying hello. How far into the explanation could I have gone? It couldn't have been that far because as soon as I started talking, the door was smashed open and the businessman bolted straight into the house. I saw that he was holding a revolver. He took one look at me and put one finger over his mouth and shushed me. You can walk away from this, he said. This is between me and Mr. O'Brien. I replied by screaming louder than I thought I ever could. The man threw his hands into the air and let out a groan of frustration and ran up the stairway opposite to the door he just kicked down. Up the stairs where the baby was. I sat on the floor for a minute, hyperventilating and practically sobbing. The phone on the floor still open with Dad on the other end. But he went upstairs to where the baby was. He went upstairs with a gun. I immediately heard a door upstairs smash open followed by loud cries of O'Brien's baby. We can all be heroes in our minds, but when things get real, how real was this? Without thinking, I ran to the kitchen and grabbed the biggest knife I could find, and without comprehending what I had chosen to do, I was face to face with the businessman in the baby's room. He was sitting in an armchair next to the crib. The baby was sitting on his knee with one thin arm wrapped around her wrist. The man had a calm look on his face, like the anticipation of what he wanted to do was superseded by the immediacy of his own act. In his expression, it was clear that in his mind, this was it, the moment that changed everything. In his other hand, he held the six-shooter directly to the baby's head. You can still walk away, he said. No. The words came out like water from a bursting tank, swift, concisely, and with it, the relief of the pressure I was feeling through this whole ordeal. In its place was just a heightened sense of the situation. The room was quiet. The baby stopped crying and was instead just grunting and moaning, its bald head and beady round eyes darting in every which way. How did you end up babysitting for the O'Briens? He asked. Just let the baby go, I demanded. You look tired, you know. That's just the thing when it comes to people who work for Mr. O'Brien, though. I'll just assume you're the daughter of one of his workers, huh? Just let the baby go. What's your name? No. Okay, then. It's okay. I can imagine that you're a bit on the younger side. It's okay to feel the way you do. A baby's life hanging by the pull of a trigger. That's a good thing, kid. A very good thing. The clarity of it fell on me like a bag of cinder blocks. Of course it did. This idiot is a talker. He's got a lot on his mind. If I could keep him talking, maybe he'd have a crisis of conscience. He had a thing against O'Brien. Maybe we could meet in the middle on that. He's my dad's boss. Of course he is. And like everyone else he's destroyed, he's got your dad running ragged, reaching through him to make those he loves run themselves ragged as well. In your case, babysitting. Let me guess, you don't have a say anymore, do you? You feel like your life is losing its value, and yet your dad would lose his chance if you backed out. I have seen him do this to so many people before him. This is what he does. This is what he does. He destroys lives for his own gain. He's a monster. Yes, I said assuredly, as I wasn't lying at all, even though it felt like I was. He's a horrible person. You should see what he does to my dad. 
the hours he works, he's using them. The way he's using you, I, I, I assume. Yes. He's used me. I worked first, second, third shift for him. Coast to coast on the clock. We weren't underpaid, not exactly, but we weren't exactly receiving a livable wage. He gave us the hours, but he stiffed us on OT. He didn't give us raises, but he always kept it just out of reach, just far enough to keep us moving forward, like a carrot on a stick. He had a way about him, you know. Silver tongue or whatever. Always promised us the future, if only we held on for a little bit longer. But every chance he had, he stiffed us. We gave him the benefit of the doubt, you know. I think I know what you mean. I said. Like a fool, I took a step into the room. In response, he pressed the gun against the temple of the baby, causing her to cry again. At point-blank range, this then would turn your head into pudding. At the range you're standing, you'd be dead before you ever heard the bang. Understand? I'm sorry. I took a step back. He immediately eased up on the weapon and removed the steel from the baby's head. The cries of the baby seemed louder than what I'd imagined the ending of the world to sound. <laughs> it does make me feel something for a change, though. He said, as if the urgency of his own threat didn't even take place. You feel something for this human being. Maybe you bonded with her during all that time you spent babysitting. Maybe you didn't. But a human life is precious to you. It was to me, you know. But to O'Brien... Just a stat in a book, quantifiable, like a notch in the day trade, a variable in a trend, a sign of when to invest, when to sell. That's what we were to him, you know, stock. That's all we were. I gave him my life, and all I asked him for in return was the right to live. I was weak. I think that's how he caught so many people in his employ. Weak people, desperate to find their life. The long hours, my baby on the way, the dream was coming true for me, and the wage increase. All I needed to do in exchange was a few favors here and there, balance the books, work the numbers, things outside of the company. The favor I was gaining in this economy, it, it meant something. Why didn't you just quit? Anyone could quit at any time. You think I didn't look for a place? You think I didn't try? This is what he did. He used people. He knew they wanted out and gave just enough to compete with what little was available and used to rest us, spend us like dogs. But anything is better than what you describe. Security at a Torres R. Russ sounds better than this. You tell your dad that. You tell him for me. You tell him that O'Brien is spending him like a bag of weed, smoking him up until he's nothing more than resin. You know what happens to me during these long hours? My wife left me. She took the baby and she left. Do you know what happened then? Head on collision, not 55. The night was rainy and she was tired and stressed. Stressed because she thought I didn't love her. Enough was enough for her. She had to give Cody a life that didn't involve neglect. She had an affair, you know, with that guy who did her taxes of all people. It's... If I was there... I could have seen it, you know. The writing was on the wall, but I wasn't. I wasn't there. I was so busy trying to make the best from what I held dear that I pushed it away. And for what? This sociopath who uses people like rolls of toilet paper. This guy who doesn't care about anything of what he has. He doesn't appreciate the life. He doesn't appreciate the life he has received. He doesn't deserve it. He pressed the barrel against the baby's head again. A deep breath to calm my nerves because this was the moment this man was anticipating. One wrong move would have been the end of this life. Killing her won't bring them back. But this man really is the sociopath you make him out to be. I put the knife on the floor to further emphasize my point. And I believe you that he is. I hear that workplace is filled with people like this. I do. And I know you've been through the ringer, but all this said... What is this life worth to him? He'll know. After the fact, he will know. Will he? Or will he see this as another way of using people? Believe me, 
I don't want to be here babysitting my life away and he's using me through my dad. And I saw you. I thought you were my dad. The way you've been run into the dirt. It's like you're a sign of what's to come. Even when he isn't using you, he's still using you. You said it yourself. The man doesn't value anything. Maybe not even this kid. Maybe he wants you to do this. It'll free him up to party. The man threw his head back and let out a loud laugh. Maybe it'll free you from this gig you've been forced into. Ever think of that? But you said it yourself. I value this child's life. The words must have held some kind of effect because after I said them, the man stared into space for a moment. Those bright eyes seemingly seeing something outside of reality. The thoughts were pouring into his head. And that's when our intimate conversation was abruptly interrupted by men screaming downstairs at the doorway that had been kicked open. This is the police. We have cause to believe that there was a man with a gun in this house, they screamed. The man's eyes focused into reality once more, and my heart, I swear to God, my heart stopped. It was a moment that could have stretched into eternity. Time just froze. That look on his face, tired, old before his old age staring into space. You could almost see the wheels in his head turn as he came to the conclusion he had come to on what he had to do. Please, please don't. The man looked at me. Downstairs, the cops had begun their sweep of the first floor. We could hear more coming upstairs, seconds away, seconds too long. Listen, he said. As he slowly stood up, baby tucked in his arm, he moved towards me. Kid, you have my gratitude. I almost made a terrible mistake. Somewhere down the line, this kid will destroy this man, or so I hope. He put the baby in my arms, which I gladly took. I'm sorry you got dragged into this, he said. And then he put the barrel of his revolver into his mouth and pulled the trigger. The rest of this was a series of high adrenaline-fueled sequences of shuffled variations of lucidity. There wasn't much to remember aside from the cries of the baby. I remember my dad holding me in what was hours later, but what felt like the very next blink of an eye. I remember Mr. O'Brien coming home, walking up to me in a fury, and firing me and my dad on the spot. I remember spending the night in the hospital, and I remember during the police debriefing that it being mentioned it took a long time to get the baby from my arms, but also, I left the phone on when the event took place, leaving my dad aware that something was going on. And from there, he was the one who called the authorities. That was around eight years ago. My dad looks better now, almost a decade later. He looks better than he ever did when he worked for Mr. O'Brien, who, based on what I hear, is still going strong, still playing his games, still playing with the lives of his workers. But I hear his baby was fine regardless, and... I suppose that's all that matters to me. While I can't say I feel sorry for the man who held his gun to the head of the baby to prove a point, I do appreciate what he said. That maybe, just maybe, this baby would grow up and see him for the monster he is, and somehow destroy him in some way, shape, or form. It's hard to say for sure what will happen. Life is pretty unpredictable, but we can only hope. A man who does this to people should at least reckon that maybe his tactics are questionable to say the very least, especially when the results are lying brainless on the floor of their infant daughter's bedroom. But for O'Brien, it wasn't even remotely effective. But I believe in karma, and I know he'll get his one day. At the time of the story, I was an 18-year-old male. I know, not typical for a teenage guy to be a babysitter, but I was a young entrepreneur, and if there was any chance of me making some money, I was going to do it, and that included babysitting. Now, the incidents I'm about to describe to you from this night still haunt my dreams and probably will continue to haunt me my entire life. It was a normal fall Saturday. I live in upstate New York, so it was cold, but not freezing and my mom's co-worker trusted me with the task of watching her son overnight. Now, this was huge for somebody like me because she was going to pay me a lot of money, and the kid was nine years old, so I figured it would be low maintenance. 
We could just stay up late, playing video games, watch movies, pig out, and have a great night. To me, this was shaving up to be a really easy way to make some quick cash and sharpen my gaming skills. Or so I thought. The kid isn't a baby, he's nine years old and can basically take care of himself. I'm just there to make sure he's safe and that somebody is watching over him and not let him do something stupid. I arrived at 3 p.m. on Saturday. We played outside in the leaves and threw the football back and forth until we got tired. I actually noticed that it was fun and I was having a good time. We went inside at about 5 p.m. I ordered some pizzas and after we ate, we just hung out and played some Overwatch. Fun's domain, by the way. It honestly wouldn't be much different if I was home alone hanging out at my place. I was having a pretty good night. We stayed up late until about midnight, I think, and then I said it was time we call the night. I told him we would camp in the living room and he was ecstatic at the idea. These people had money. A lot of money. So to give you an idea of the layout of the house, the living room was in the far right corner of the house if you walk into the front door. We took a step down into this huge room with cathedral ceilings, I would say at least 20 feet or higher. Once he stepped down into the living room to the left is a wall with a giant 80 inch TV. It was pretty amazing playing video games on. In front of the TV was a huge beautiful sectional that wrapped around most of the living room and then a recliner right near the step down when you first get into the living room. Lastly, behind the sectional on the back wall, completely across from the TV was a huge massive window that overlooked a swamp and forest. It was beautiful despite being called a swamp. The window was nearly the entire length of the ceiling. So, finally, settling down for the night, I shut off all the lights. The boy got cozy on the sectional, and I turned the recliner around 180 degrees to face looking out the window. With all the lights off, the moon looked beautiful reflecting off the swamp water. I heard the boy snoring, and it didn't take long for me to drift off as well. Now this is where the story starts to get off the rails, and I still can't quite explain it. I woke up with a jolt at 3.06 a.m., I remember specifically. I know the exact time because I looked at my phone. Shaken up for some reason, I couldn't really get comfortable. I tossed and turned for a minute, but just couldn't find the sweet spot. And what happened next still makes me sick. I decided to stare out into the swamp to try and relax, and what I saw began to make me tremble. A figure, standing right outside in front of the swamp. Not moving at all, the black silhouette looked like a statue. I was completely still, starting to quietly panic if this figure could see me or not. I looked back and the boy was still sleeping on the couch. Before I could look back at the man, I hear a knock at the door. This couldn't be happening, I thought. Not here. Not to me. I slowly made my way down the long hallway and looked out the side window. There wasn't anybody at the front door. I felt a very short moment of relief until I remember the figure outside, and the terror came back to me. As I slowly made my way back into the living room using only the bright moonlight as my guide as when I began to truly panic. The boy was standing on the back of the couch staring out the window with his arms wide open. What is happening? I ran into the room as fast as I could in hopes that the dark figure didn't see the young boy. As I grabbed the boy to help him down, he didn't even flinch or move. It was like he was frozen or something. I said his name a couple of times to try and wake him from his trance and instead of waking, he just looked up at me and smiled and said, He's back. I looked out the window and the dark figure began to sprint toward the window. Terrified, my instincts just kicked in and I ran out of the living room into the hall and turned into the father's office and locked the door. It was at that moment I realized I left the boy out there in the living room. I left him there with that sprinting shadow man. My fear got the better of me and I just ran. What a coward, I thought. After what seemed like hours, but in reality was only maybe seconds, I decided to go and get the boy and my cell phone which I left in the recliner so I could call the police. I opened the door slowly and there at the end of the hall was the boy. I could barely make out the details of his face with the moonlight but he looked as if though he was smiling. He was standing stiff with his arms hunched over He had something in his hand. I can't be certain what was in his hand but it shined like a knife. I immediately turned around and went back into the office. The wall clock said 3.17. The horror I had endured was barely 10 minutes, but it felt like hours. 
I stayed there hiding under the desk, crying for about an hour. Now, I was a big, strong football player. Cowering in a ball and crying was not something I did ever in my life. At about 4.25 a.m., I opened the door. The boy was lying in the middle of the hallway where he was standing an hour ago. I slowly made my way to the boy. He was breathing and seemed to be peacefully asleep. He had no knife or anything of the sort in his hand or around his person. I was 100% sure he was holding something. I took the boy into the office with me and shut the door. I stayed up watching the door and the boy until the sun started to come up. At shortly after 6.30, I opened the office door again. I took the boy and placed him on the couch. I began to calm down a little bit, but I was not going back to sleep. I couldn't comprehend what I saw. The whole event seemed more like a nightmare than something that could actually happen, and I often wonder if maybe it was. The boy's parents were supposed to be home at noon. At 11 a.m., the boy was awake. And we had some cereal, watched YouTube on the smart TV. He laughed and joked with me and said how much fun the night was. He asked if I could stay over again, and I, of course, smiled and said, Yeah, buddy, we'll see. Could this kid really not have any memory of what happened? I just endured the worst night and most terrorizing night of my entire life, and this kid can't remember anything. Shortly before noon, I got myself all ready to go home. The boy started playing video games, and I told him I would be right back. I went outside using the back door and approached the front of the pond. And what I saw almost made me collapse in fear. Right where I saw the figure standing the night before were two muddy footprints, and the footprints made their way all the way to the window where I saw the man run. I followed the footprints all the way to the front door, and there by the door was a kitchen knife. I couldn't explain it, and still can't. I brought the knife inside and said goodbye to the boy. His parents arrived and paid me. I couldn't bring myself to telling this to the parents as I myself didn't even know if it was truly reality. I left so fast and I couldn't get the images of that night out of my head. I don't sleep well anymore and I'm not sure if I ever will. But one thing is for sure, I will never babysit again. <laughs>